Welcome to The Criminologist, the podcast dedicated to educating and entertaining our listeners. We bring you subject matter experts from around the world and share the latest and greatest evidence-based practices and interventions to help individuals desist from a life of crime and delinquency. This podcast avoids stereotypes and biases in favor of the lived experiences of those we can best learn from. Now, please welcome the host of The Criminologist, Joseph Arvidsson. Hello and welcome to episode 124 of The Criminologist podcast. Happy to have you all with us today. I actually teased the appearance of our next guest a few weeks back, and I'm so glad that we were finally able to connect and coordinate our schedules for this interview. As you are likely aware, we love showcasing the probation perspectives of our partners around the world. So it is time to once again get out your listener passports, my friends, for we are off to France for this week's show. Elliot Luan is a probation officer in the nation of France. He is also a trainer of a variety of evidence-based practices and core correctional skills. And I was delighted to discover he has also been trained in the sticks practice model. Now, longtime listeners of the show have heard my interviews with both Dr. James Bonta and Dr. Guy Bergon, both of whom were instrumental in the building of the sticks practice model. And actually, Elliot has in fact been trained by Guy himself on this approach. A great illustration of how good ideas tend to travel far. I loved speaking with Elliot as to risk, needs, responsivity approaches, implementation struggles, and so much more. Please enjoy my conversation with Elliot Luan, and I will see you all on the other side. Welcome to the show, Elliot Luan, and so glad to be joined by our first guest ever from France. And are you in Paris right now, Elliot? Uh, no, I'm not. Um, I mean, living in and working in a city called Angers, okay, which is about a, a, an hour and a half from Paris by train, west, west side of France. Sounds beautiful. Why don't you introduce yourself to our audience, Elliot, maybe by touching on some of your educational and professional highlights leading up to the role you're in today, and then we'll do a deep dive on some of these other questions. Okay. Um, well, uh, I've been working as a probation officer for 19 years now, after two years of full-time training in our national school of uh, correctional school which is in Agen in the south of France. Um, I do have a master's degree in uh, American history. And, uh, well, I prepared a few uh, diplomas in uh, forensic psychiatry and criminology. Okay. So um, currently I do work full-time as a probation officer. I am also a lecturer on several university degrees. And I've been providing professional training uh, for almost, well, maybe seven years now um, on around core correctional practices, mainly, and um, risk assessment also. Uh, I also participate in several working groups, uh, particularly on domestic violence and for the National Order of Physicians. And uh, lately, I've been involved in uh, a training course to become a certified trainer in the changes program, which is more known as uh, STICS program, uh, which which was the strategic training initiative in community supervision, initially developed by the uh, Correctional Service of Canada. Yeah, so much that I already want to go back and talk about here. Um, so you mentioned two years of training to become a pr probation officer sounded like I am myself. am also a, a evidence-based trainer, trainer of core correctional skills. And I would love to talk to you about that a little bit. What goes into that sort of onboarding or preparation for probation officers just starting in the field. Maybe just give us the snapshot of what that journey looks like for those individuals. 
Okay. Um, well, the the system in France um, allows you to be uh, to become a probation officer, but you have to uh, to do a two years training in uh, in our national school where uh, probation officers, uh, prison wardens, uh, um, all uh, correctional uh, officers are trained. Um, those two years are going to be. Uh, well, um, a balance between some time spent in the probation departments or in the prisons, because uh, probation officers in France do work uh, both in the prisons and uh, in the community. So uh, there's one single job if you want to work in the prison or as a probation officer outside of the prison. And um, there's a balance between uh, those periods of uh, training at our national school and periods of uh, well, exercising as a probation officer in a probation department. So it sounds like a little bit of schooling and then also what we refer to here in the United States as on-the-job training, that they're hired but still continuing in their training as they go. Yes, exactly. Uh, the first year is uh, mainly about training uh, at the national school, and second year is uh, – mainly about spending your, the year uh, in probation departments and starting to work as a, as a PO. My longtime listeners know because I often talk about it, but I will in fact be leaving in not too long to once again train at uh, Iwan Dernescu's International Training School on Core Correctional Skills in Barcelona. Mm-hmm. So we may have to do some follow-up, Elliot, to look at what the curriculum looks like that you have folks going through and what Professor Dernescu's curriculum on core correctional skills looks like. I'm really curious about those similarities, which, of course, I always love exploring. And then you also mentioned the STIX program. I've known Dr. Bergon for years. Was he part of the the team that came over to train you? Or can you maybe talk about your experience with the STIX practice model and what those implementation struggles and or successes have looked like? Yes, definitely. Um, Dr. Bergon is... um has been training us for a, a couple of years now in France. So it's part of an experiment to implement the, the, the formerly known uh, STIX program, uh, which is now uh, known as a changes program. Okay. And, um, well, we're, we've been lucky and we're still, uh, still are lucky to, <laughs> to, um, benefit from his, uh, from his training. Uh, and we do have to, uh, Train on our part, um, colleagues in France around the, the changes programs, the sticks programs, if, if you prefer. And, um, well, that's, it's kind of amazing to, to work around this program as, uh, um, as you know, probably there's a two year supervision. Uh, once you've done the, the initial training, that's kind of, uh, you know, unusual, very unusual for us in France to have uh, an initial training of five days and then monthly meetings and, uh, Doing supervision, so it's kind of a well. We are very lucky to be uh, to be part of this training program. I'm curious. I have to ask Elliot when I've interacted with uh, Dr. Bergon. He introduced me to his spot the dog exercise to to um, get people to understand the thought behavior link. Is there a French version of the spot the dog exercise that you train your probation officers mm-hmm. well, for? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, initially. Um, we talked a lot about this uh, little dog spots and uh, spots. And uh, my opinion with that, uh, it wouldn't work in France. Uh, that you know, um, offenders would say, "Well, uh, I don't, I don't work with you on this basis." Um, I guess we had a good advice uh, uh, on that point, and uh, uh, he told us that maybe we could try first. We should try, and then we'll see how it works. Uh, from my experience. Using this, uh, you know, sequence of work with uh, offenders, uh, well, it works very well. I mean, people just don't uh, ask anything about that, and uh, you know, they just uh, get the main ideas and uh, they learn very, very fast. Okay, so uh, uh, I think it's well. Now, my opinion is that it's not a problem anymore. But uh, first opinion with that could be difficult to, to work, you know, using a, a dog and saying that you're kind of conditioning people as, uh, you know, animals are being conditioned or definitely there. There's no problem uh, using this, uh, these techniques and approach. Yeah. I appreciate the fact that, that Guy and his team at least were looking for 
alternate ways to illustrate, again, that all important concept of the link between an individual's thoughts uh, and their behaviors. So you've been giving us some insight about probation in France. What is another aspect of probation in France that you could share with our audiences, particularly, Elliot, as it pertains to the use of, again, what we refer to as core correctional skills, core correctional practices, even evidence-based practices? Um, Well, uh, I'd say that probation in France uh, would perhaps seem a little exotic to North American colleagues, uh, uh, even though there are some similarities. A few points uh, or similarities uh, or differences. Uh, We could start by saying that, uh, for example, there is uh, no difference between the supervision of people under probation or under parole. Um, We do work as probation officers in France, in the prisons and outside the, the prisons, as I told earlier, but um, we can also say that we do uh, supervise every kind of, uh, you know, offenders. Okay, so you have people under probation, under parole. Um, another difference with uh, some, uh, well, North American probation departments is that we do not have still uh, any standardized assessment uh, system, risk assessment system. Okay. Uh, so we don't use any, uh, you know, risk assessment tools like, you know, LSCMI, for example. Uh, we don't have any uh, tools to assess any uh, violent recidivism, uh, as we don't have any tools to assess any specific kind of recidivism, you know, for example, domestic violence or sexual offending. So it's kind of, um, you know, it sounds weird maybe, but uh, uh, well, we don't have these um, tools available for probation officers. Um, a few years ago, and I'll be talking about that later maybe, but um, um, evidence-based practices started to, um, you know, I don't know how to say that, infuse or develop in France. And, uh, um, well, some departments are, you know, having, uh, there's gaining interest, we could say, um, around, uh, you know, evidence-based practices and the use of these tools. So we start having some, Trainings, you know, to to know how to use the LSCMI and uh, you know the SARA, the uh, many different tools like the Static ninety nine and uh, okay, so that's a huge difference, uh, I think, uh, with uh, North American departments, probation departments. Um, another difference, or uh, just to give you an idea of what it looks like in France, we do not have any. Um, correctional programs in the sense of programs, correctional programs developed in North America, depending on the the level of risk, according to the level of risk. And as we don't have uh, any risk assessment tools, it makes sense. So um, we do not use currently studied correctional programs, which, you know, showed some uh, kind of efficiency, okay, to reduce recidivism. Um, Rather, we still work on using programs which are more, um, well, we could say like uh, the intention is uh, is to prevent recidivism, but it it looks like, uh, well, maybe discussion groups or uh, even if you have specific topics to to work on with offenders, but, uh, you know, it's not a... well, these programs, the programs we use in France uh, are scarcely ever evaluated. Okay. Uh, just to give you an idea, um, program, a typical program in France is about 20, uh, well, 12 to 15 sessions. It's an hour and a half, two hours per session. So, uh, we are very far from, you know, the high risk programs developed in Canada or in the US uh, where you spend 200 hours or 300 hours uh, you know with offenders so that's uh, the kind of uh, the, the gold standard in France you know 12 to 15 sessions <laughs> okay but that's the beginning um, the vast majority of uh, supervision in France is uh, face-to-face interviews okay saying that uh, I often say that um, if you have um, like an average probation department you have like 2,000 offenders, okay, supervised. Um, maybe 30 to 50 offenders every year will benefit a correctional program. The, the rest of them will be supervised on a face-to-face uh, basis, okay? So uh, that's, uh, I think, uh, uh, one thing that is quite special in France. 
Um, well, uh, I guess probation is uh, in France look like looks like probation in uh, other countries. We do start with an assessment, but without using any uh, standardized tools. So it's kind of a structure judgment, okay, but not using tools. So. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, we can talk about that later if you want. Uh, we try to define a um, case management plan, and uh, then we start, you know, having interviews face to face with uh, with offenders. Usually, um, well, we have interviews every month and a half, every two months. Okay, and um, a probation term is, uh, I am, I think, on average, is about twenty four months. Okay, long. So. It makes, you know, like, you know, 15, uh, 15 interviews. And uh, during this, uh, this lap of time, um, maybe we could talk about workloads per agent. And I'll, I'll stop on that for the, for the French system. Um, well, it may vary, depends on where you work. If you're in Paris or Toulouse or whatever, um, you can have uh, 75 to 80 offenders okay that you have to supervise and you you can go up to 130 offenders per agent okay this morning i checked for for the uh for the podcast and i i had uh 112 offenders okay on my caseload wow this is fascinating to me elliot so on the one hand i'm thinking to myself congratulations on being so progressive that you have adopted the sticks practice model, but I'm still struggling to get over the feedback you gave about not using those, those structured assessments. Let's delve a little bit more to that. If you don't mind, uh, again, it just kind of strikes me that again, your sounds like embracing the risk need responsivity model, maybe, but maybe not so much on the risk assessment part. What does that, uh, look like? And, or just what's behind that decision not to embrace or, or utilize, I should say, for example, you mentioned the LSCMI. I'm an LSCMI trainer. So again, what's behind that decision or why do you feel France isn't there yet with use of those actuarial risk assessment tools? To understand uh, the way it is in France, maybe it's good to uh, go back to uh, 2014, uh, which is the year during which the, there was a huge conference that was organized in France um, called a uh, conference de consensus. Okay. The idea was to, um, to take stock of the uh, available knowledge about, uh, you know, what could be done to reduce recidivism. Okay. Before 2014, uh, well, even if uh, some people uh, were already interested, interested by that, uh, there was very little interest about, you know, structuring a probation supervision. Okay. So, um, all uh, that was uh, evidence-based was, you know, very, uh, uh, you know, like secret, okay, and very uh, intimate. Very few people knew about that, okay. Uh, a study made by Saadino in France in 2010 helped to uh, discover that we were not using, you know, evidence-based practices during supervision. And um, following that conference in 2013, not 14, sorry, um, several laws pa were passed in France and adopted, and um, our administration decided to uh, choose and implement a model, which was the RNR model. Okay, so it wasn't, uh, you know, frankly maybe uh, said, but that was the RNR model. Um, it was very difficult for um, our administration, I guess, to uh, to choose a model and uh, decide that we would implement it in France. So, I guess uh, they said that. We would need stages and uh, then we would need to go step by step before professional, you know, French probation officers accept the idea of uh, using a model and structuring more their supervisions and uh, using uh, risk assessment tools coming from countries, uh, you know, uh, Anglo Saxons countries. And it was like, ah, you know, you're using uh, the tools of the devil. So uh, <laughs> it took a bit of time. Um, I think it's, better today uh, well it depends on uh, the way you, you look at things but uh, uh, it's much better today I think professionals have understood uh, the um, the use using a, a more structured approach the the 
use, uh, you know, how it can help us to, to, to use risk assessment tools and mostly how it can help people uh, that we supervise to, uh, you know, uh, take some distance with uh, crime. And uh, so it's, it's not as, uh, as complicated as, as it was uh, at the beginning of 2010, between 2010 and 2014. It's not uh, still decided if we need to use one risk assessment tools uh, or several risk assessment tools. And there's, a, uh, I would say, some, uh, well, we, we do uh, lack uh, explanations for people who decide maybe to understand that there's uh, no, well, it, it doesn't make sense to use only one risk assessment tools. Okay, so uh, you need to, to use a general risk assessment tool, and then you need to to use other risk assessment, you know, tools for specific violence or delinquency. So, so uh, it's getting better, but uh, it takes time, and um, it takes us back to the the history of probation in France. So, talk about that now. Um, our departments, probation departments, were created in 1999, and before 1999. Um, you know, uh, it was mostly educators working in the prisons or uh, in the probation departments, but it wasn't the name. So um, uh, educators and, uh, well, uh, social service uh, professionals. So these, uh, you know, these two jobs kind of uh, melted into uh, what is known today as a CPIP, okay, uh, which is a probation officer. That That's a great summation, Elliot. And again, I appreciate what you noted there as far as implementation and how change is difficult, not just for the clients we supervise, but for staff members and departments. So I can totally relate to, again, your, your nation's not hesitance, but feelings towards, again, suddenly adapting these risk tools and, and embracing this model risk needs responsivity model wholeheartedly. Yeah. Again, uh, change takes time. What other takeaways could you share with our audience? Maybe not about risk needs responsivity necessarily, but again, overall on the implementation of those core correctional skills or evidence-based practices. You mentioned, for example, case management plans. Are you seeing these things slowly creep into the day-to-day practice of your probation officers? Yes, uh, I would say uh, slowly. Uh, it takes a, a bit of time, but... Uh, it's well the the implementation of uh, EBP is very uh, theoretical today, um, and it varies from you know probation departments. Uh, you know it really depends on where you work. Some um, agents, some probation officers, try to structure their supervisions using the RNL model, using the uh, uh, well, the words, I mean, using case management plans in France, which is called PASEP or, okay. So, um, you know, uh, we do uh, observe that uh, there's a, a huge interest, uh, maybe especially from uh, very young probation officers uh, leaving uh, our national school. Uh, we must also say that uh, our national school puts uh, huge efforts uh, those uh, last six, seven years to, uh, well, have uh, new probation officers and, uh, trained uh, around uh, you know ABPs and uh, okay so um, well it really depends and you can uh, also uh, you know uh, still have uh, some colleagues which is not a uh, necessarily uh, a problem but uh, we do work on a more traditional approach of uh, you know a social work practice uh, and tend to offer a supervision that is uh, more centered on well we could say social issues without uh, always you know. Uh, uh, considering the situations uh, under the light of, uh, you know, risk assessment and recidivism. I don't know if I'm clear, but. Uh... I think I understand. Yes. Again, it sounds like your approach is more, again, of coming from that helping lens versus, and I can only speak to my experiences here in the United States, but we are still sort of trying to undo the, the early, <laughs> the early approaches of, framing the profession more along the lines of law enforcement versus social worker. So now when we try to introduce these core correctional skills and evidence-based practices, that just is another hurdle we have to get over. Whereas it sounds like in France, at least, you started out more from that place as far as, for example, 
school teachers filling this role. And it always, it sounds like at least Elliot, correct me if I'm wrong, was coming from more of that, again, that social worker or helping human services profession versus, as we were here, more of that law enforcement, surveillance, containment lens. Yeah, that's uh, exactly how it is in France. You're right. That's a big difference with the uh, this American system. Um, yes, uh, our culture, professional culture, comes from social work. So, uh, you know, we, we don't have uh, – much problems about, you know, uh, uh, saying probation officers, uh, you're too much, you know, uh, uh, law enforcement officer, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, pay attention to your the, the skills you use. No, it's more uh, like, uh, well, maybe, uh, you know, it's uh, social work, maybe too much. Maybe you could, uh, you know, find like a balanced approach of uh, all the works by, uh, you know, Vaparese, Jean Drouin, and uh, all we know about core correctional practices. So, um, well, I, I think it's, you know, it's coming, but uh, it takes time to, uh, to have people, uh, understand the, the, uh, the, well, the, the benefits of uh, using, uh, all these, uh, core correctional practices and also how to, uh, use these, uh, skills and techniques within a daily practice. I mean, that's, uh, it, it often sounds like, uh, it's impossible that, uh, as we've seen, we have uh, quite uh, important caseloads in France. Uh, and uh, even if you train people around core correctional practices, you know, the first thing they tell you that, uh, well, I do have uh, 120 offenders. How do you want me to do that? How do you expect me to, <laughs> to use, you know, uh, motivational interviewing, uh, uh, role clarification, yes. clarification uh, and so on and so on. So, you know. I could tell you that's universal, Elliot, as a, as a, as a trainer. I hear that quite a bit. Joe, we just don't have the time for this. We just don't have the time for this. Um, the, the preoccupation is just somewhere else. Yeah. Um, we love talking about the topic of desistance from crime on this pad on this podcast, rather. To what degree has desistance taken hold in French probation, Elliot? We could say the, the, the issue of uh, desistance um, hasn't, well, did not benefit um, huge uh, publicity in France. Okay. So, uh, I guess now, uh, which was not the case a few years ago, there was a study by a, a French researcher, Martin Azagivans in 2011, I guess, uh, saying that, you know, professionals didn't know about that, uh, that, that, uh, that term. Okay. Um, well, now, um, French profession, probation officers are very interested in, uh, Supporting desistance, um, it was held by the the release of the uh, European Rules on Probation and by the Council of Europe in 2010, which only arrived in France in 2013. Which is important to to understand uh, how long it took to um, for us to to know these uh, these terms. Um, well, uh, so I think people now work to support desistance in probation departments. Okay, uh, still the um, you know the 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 works and the uh, literature around desistance is still unknown. Um, just to give you an example, uh, people say, well, we need to, uh, to have people, uh, you know, uh, leaving their uh, criminal career, for example. But, uh, we scarcely ever hear about, uh, things like, uh, uh the important things in, uh, in desistance, like, uh, you know, social capital, human capital, and the importance also of, uh, um, well, identity questions. Uh, you know, so they say, well, I'm not sure that everybody has understood that it is a process that uh, mostly plays outside of probation departments, okay, outside of prisons, and that is a process that uh, uh, involves the community, involves families, and that we need to work on a on a more uh, you know, uh, on a larger basis if we want to support desistance. So um, I'd say we need to uh, to. Uh, Train people more about the systems and uh, make sure that they understand how it works and uh, that it is uh, a process, which is uh, most important, I think. To be clear, it has not taken off in the United, in the United States uh, that much either, Elliot. I asked sort of within the context of I know I've done some traveling and some work in Europe, and I know that there's pockets over there in Europe uh, where the assistance models are really starting to take off. You mentioned, Elliot, the Council of Europe, and I'm curious, does 
French probation work closely and or have members with uh, CEP, the Confederation of European Probation? Well, that's a that's a good question. Uh, well, uh, I wish uh, you know uh, our administration you know, could work more with the uh, Council of Europe. Uh, uh, we don't see uh, you know many people from France in the. Uh, you know all these uh, conferences in Europe, so I think it's a it's a pity that we don't participate more because we do have a system which is specific. Uh, maybe we could gain, uh, you know, from uh, you know listening to uh, foreign experiences, and uh, uh, it's a shame, as especially as uh, uh, the rules of probation were. Uh, uh, I think we we had them yeah in two thousand thirteen, and now um, well it's. Everybody knows uh, the, the rules from the, the Council of Europe. Okay, so we know it exists. Uh, we know it's uh, you know common sense, good common sense. Uh, we know it's uh, uh, based on our researches and uh, okay, there's no nonsense in the in the rules of the uh, the Council of Europe. Still, it's very difficult to have uh, and to find probation departments which. Um, you know, uh, say that, well, uh, I'm going to try to implement everything that is in the uh, uh, these rules, and I want my department to be, uh, you know, kind of a, a model um, using the these rules. Uh, I often think about the, uh, the probation department in Jersey, uh, which we had the, the pleasure to invite in, in France in uh, 2018, and the way um, the, um, the probation department um, Tried and uh, achieved, I think, uh, to uh, well, yeah, to, to make you know rules or uh, um, principles a reality. Well, to 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 have evidence based practices infusing probation practices, and you know, so we still don't have this kind of probation department in France, but it's also linked to the way we are structured. Uh, it's not federal in France, or. It's not in Jersey, but uh, uh, it's, it's everything comes from Paris. We have a central administration, and then um, I think it is very difficult to organize and uh, uh, to have all probation departments in, in France uh, do the same thing, you know, with, a, with the same motivation. So okay, it's going to take time, but uh, it's still well. Uh, I'd say that. Uh, we still not enforce uh, all the recommendations from the, the Council of Europe, definitely. Like I said, implementation, I believe, is really the next frontier. Um, as we've noted, nobody's really reinventing the risk-need-responsivity model, but the devil's in the details as far as implementation. And it sounds like those struggles are universal, regardless of which side of the Atlantic <laughs> we are on. What does the future hold for Elliot Luan? Elliot, I forgot if I have you back on the program in a year or two, look, look into the future, look into your crystal ball, as we say. And what do you think we might be chatting about in the, in the future, my friend? Well, um, I hope we'll be chatting about uh, the implementation of uh, evidence-based practices in uh, probation practices and probation departments in France. And then we can talk about the, the situation in in two years, you know, and saying that well, uh, we, we've done it. So uh, I'm still working on it uh, at my level. I'm still very interested by that. Um, more specifically, uh, I must say that uh, I'm very uh, interested and I take a lot of pleasure working about around the, uh, the changes programs, which is the well, the new version of the, the STICS program. And uh, I definitely want to uh, keep on training colleagues uh, around this uh, program and train, you know, colleagues on uh, how to, uh, you know, use uh, cognitive behavioral uh, techniques to, to work with offenders, which is not, uh, you know, uh, as we've talked about uh, earlier, uh, very uh, well adopted and in our culture in France to, you know, to work with these, uh, these techniques. So, um, well, uh, I definitely hope that these kind of programs, evaluated programs that, are, that have shown results to reduce recidivism will be, uh, you know, the next step and that, uh, our administration will, uh, will, uh, encourage, uh, colleagues in France to, to train, uh, train to, uh, you know, core correctional practices. Definitely. 
Well, I can say that the nation of France and their probation system in particular are blessed to have you, Elliot. We've only been talking for about 30 minutes, but I can tell already you are a true subject matter expert on so many of these things. So keep fighting the good fight and let me know if I can be of any assistance. And I hope to talk to you in the future sometime, my friend. Thank you, Elliot. Okay. Thank you, Joseph. See you soon. A big criminologist podcast. Thank you once again to Elliot Luan for appearing on the show and sharing with us his insights into French probation. Always encouraging for me to speak with individuals from around the world whom we may not share English as our first language, but as you heard there, clearly we speak the same language as far as core correctional skills, evidence-based practice, and implementation. So again, thank you, Elliot, for sharing your subject matter expertise with our audience this week. Elliot also shared a link, which is in the show notes of this episode for a podcast, which you wanted me to share with you all. So if you want to learn a bit more about French criminology and culture, check out the podcast link that I left in the show notes of this program. We will be back next week with a fresh episode. In the meantime, you may contact the show or reach out to us through our website, the Paragon Group, LLC.com, for training or presentations as to core correctional skills, implementation, program design, or, of course, the topic of desistance from crime. If you have questions or comments as to this podcast, feel free to contact the show via our email at thecriminologistpodcast at gmail.com. That's thecriminologistpodcast at gmail.com. Remember to follow us through our Facebook and Instagram pages at The Criminologist Podcast. New fun images are being added all the time to those feeds. You don't want to miss out. The Criminologist Media Group is on Twitter. Give us a follow at Crim Media Group. That's C-R-I-M Media Group. You may also connect with me, Joseph Arvidsson, or Elliot Luan on LinkedIn and follow both The Criminologist Podcast and The Paragon Group on our LinkedIn pages. Lastly, if you've not already done so, check out and subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Criminologist, for additional content as to the themes of this podcast. Hey, merchandise is now available. Visit us at theparagongroupllc.com and look for the shop tab on the website to get access to coffee mugs, pens, refrigerator magnets, Simply a way to show your support for the show. You may also click on the Become a Supporter link in the show notes of this episode if you wish to become a financial supporter of the program as well. You can do so for as little as $3 per month or save a little bit of money by opting to become a yearly supporter. And if you believe in what we're doing on the podcast, if you're part of the movement, please spread the word. Tell a friend or a coworker or a colleague about us. Ask them to subscribe to the podcast. And of course, do so yourself if you've not already done so. And always remember, folks, there's no them. There's only us. Uh, you know, uh, Anglo-Saxon countries, and it was like that. You know, you're using uh, the tools of the devil. <laughs> uh, the important things in uh, in desistance, like uh, you know, social capital, human capital, and the importance also of uh, well, identity questions. The Criminologist Podcast is a production of the Paragon Group LLC. For speaking engagements, interviews, program design, or training opportunities, please visit us at theparagongroupllc.com. If you enjoyed the show, you can find more content and videos on our YouTube channel, The Criminologist. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Both The Criminologist podcast and The Criminologist channel are brought to you by The Criminologist Media Group. Be sure to give us a five-star review, and thanks for listening.